so uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, public transport information coordination group um, I hope you've all had a good summer although we seem to be having it yesterday and today um, and uh, by tomorrow it'll all be rain and, and autumn by the uh, by the looks of the weather forecast certainly up there but uh, I, I hope you had a good a good period since the end of May, since we last met anyway. Um, so um, we've got um, a few um, people that might not know everybody else. So it is worth um, trying to do some introductions. Um, it's always fun in big groups like this when people are still joining. Um, but um, let's start with, so I'm Tim Rivett. I run Artig on a day-to-day -day basis and am the chair of this group. Um, Alex, you're first on my list. Hi there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm Alex Cranton. Um, I am a software developer uh, and I work with um, West Yorkshire and Hertfordshire County Council on um, their sort of PT data management system. Um, so we're not actually um, making some of these changes just yet because we've got some intermediaries are dealing with the data that the uh, that they're working with um, to, to pass it into BODs, um, but it's something that we might be looking at in the future. So uh, that's that's why I'm here. Okay, excellent. Um, Aiden. Hello. Can you hear yeah, me? hello. Yes. yes. Is this introduction? Sorry. It is, yes. Yeah, hello, everyone. Aiden Proctor from Omnibus Solutions. Uh, uh, Alex Clark. Afternoon, everybody. Alex Clark, um, Public Transport Officer for for Caerphilly County Borough Council in South Wales. I appreciate that a lot of the issues being discussed are England only, um, but we're implementing so much new stuff at the moment, like tap off readers and things like that. It's good to kind of know where everybody else is, and then we can hopefully use some of your experience to feed into what we're doing. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, Amy. Hello, yeah, um, Amy Brown, Open Data Platform Manager for Travel Line. Hi, uh, Chris Sherry. Uh, hello, I'm Chris. Um, I'm the developer at Passenger Technology Group. Um, and we mostly uh, we work with operators all over the country and we push data into BODs. OK, um, Dr. J. Sorry, I'm just trying to get the mute to work. Hey, I'm Dr. J. I use those pronoun. Um, I'm a service designer, business analyst from ThoughtWorks, working for DFT on the redevelopment of NAPTAM project. Um, Adrian Falconer, who's the product owner, will be along when we need him. He's I, We're just splitting time across meetings between us. So if you can give me a five minutes he heads up, Tim, that would be much appreciated of when we're needed. Yeah, yeah. okay, cool. Uh, Jess Jackson. Hello all, um, I'm working for DFT as the policy advisor and uh, in communications on the BODS team. Okay, excellent, welcome. Um, John Carr. Hello, uh, hello, John Carr from the ATCO board. Josh Goodwin. Hi, Josh Goodwin here from BusTimes.org. Hi, uh, Julie. Hi, uh, Julie Williams, Chief Exec for uh, Travel Line and Bus Bus. Uh, thank you. Uh, Keith Willis. Uh, Keith Willis, React Accessibility. Uh, Mark Taylor. Um, hi, I work for Staffordshire County Council. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Mike Baxter. Hi. Hi there. Um, yeah, I'm a Transport Development Officer for the City Council um, with um, 
my ticketing and uh, real-time information on my plate. I'm particularly interested in the real-time information side of things and uh, not been able to keep abreast of it just lately. Uh, so I'm I'm just sort of sitting in today because I've I've not been as active as I normally am. And I work for, well, Leicester City Council, by the way, not Staffordshire County Council as on the minutes, Theresa. Sorry. To, <laughs> as, I'd, I'd sorry. proofed them as well, Mike. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> All right, cheers. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nick Carey. Uh, Nick Carey, Director of Waste Field, working with uh, Minute Taker, uh, member Theresa, and also Mark Cartwright, who many of you know. You're really through... quiet, Nick. Oh. Ah. That's because my microphone was up in my hair. <laughs> Well, the little hair that I have. Yes, is that better? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So working with well, Secretary Theresa and member and uh, also someone m m m known to many of you, Mark Cartwright, on trying to improve real-time information, working with bus operators and authorities. And the focus at the moment is trying to get um, people to stop auto-populating fields so that we can actually get the consistency that you're driving with DFT, Tim, on the... Um, Trans Exchange uh, profile for 2.4, and also the the Siri VM profile for 2.4. A lot of auto population is defeating that, but we actually want a journey code to be consistent across all of these things, and uh, it's taking up a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Peter Stoner. Uh, thank you. With with Eto World, um, working on. Um, our contributions to the, the BODS project and also data going to Google Maps and uh, Apple Maps and others. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Um, Rebecca Rowe. Oh, I had trouble there with the microphone myself. Um, yeah, Rebecca Rowe. Um, I'm the Service Information Manager for South Yorkshire PTE. Hi, uh, Rob West. There we go. It took a while to get that microphone to engage there. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm a software architect and consultant specialising in transport open data. Um, I'm a founder at a company called Illidium, and we're building um, bus open data tools and services. Thank you. Uh, Theresa Jolly. Oh, hang on. I'm the mic on. Sorry. You're on. Oh, oh, I am. Right. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, Theresa Jolly, um, Secretary for this, uh, doing the minutes quicker than I have been and hopefully getting people's names right, Mark, and locations. So um, I'm just sitting in. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tony Davis. Uh, afternoon, it's uh, Tony Davis, uh, Commercial Assistant at uh, Wellgrade Group covering Trent Barton, uh, TM Travel and uh, Nuts and Derby, uh, our constituent companies. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Tricia Wright? Yeah. yeah, Tricia Wright from Nottinghamshire County Council. Hi, uh, uh, Triumph. Uh, hi, I'm um, Triumph Okoje um, from uh, the DFT BODS team. Um, I work with uh, Miranaya and Jess. I will be responsible for um, elements of product management and benefit realization. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Um, Ian, you've come and gone a few times. <laughs> Don't know whether. And he says he's left online. Yeah, yeah, I think he's got some microphone troubles. Um, Jonathan, you joined us as we've been going along? Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Jonathan Raper, uh, CEO of Transport API. It's dressed down Wednesday, so I've got my football shirt on. Um, we are providers of public transport information to all the first group, um, South Yorkshire, Transport for the North, West Midlands Trains, National Express, uh, a bunch of different um, uh, operators, and uh, yeah, um, getting to grips with BODs um, in a fairly major way now. 
especially on fares. Uh, we've got the we've got a fares API um, uh, up and running now from Bods. That's me. Excellent. Thank you. I think that's uh, everybody. Um, so um, minutes of well, um, we've got apologies from Yan Sui from the Bods DFT team. Um, I think from Mira Naya, who may or may not come, she said, um, but has given apologies as well. And David Batchelor from Ticketer, who is busy um, working with operators trying to sort out uh, BODS compliance with them. Um, so, um, as well as getting um, a few um, things wrong in the attendees list and the last um um minutes um we have a mystery visitor last month or last time we met um lmg so if anybody's got any idea who that is we'd like to correct the record um but uh, it was a mystery to uh, to us who that was okay um actions from the minutes of last meeting um so um there was an action um on yan to um follow up school service operators there were some examples shared during the meeting and there's been further work um going on um trying to identify and work with school operators to understand whether they should or shouldn't be um putting data into bods or whether they're required to or not um and uh, and that carries on but i think it's better understood now and the otc and dvsa are more engaged um in helping understand whether um data sh is required or whether it's a um you can if you want um there was um, a, and the other action was um, John Carr was going to um, take um, back to the ATCO board um, discussion about fares and BSIP. You're muted, John. Sorry, it is slow getting through these days. Um, yes, the board meeting is actually next week, so um, I'll chase it up again then. Yeah, uh, everybody, okay. as you will imagine, is is pretty heavily committed writing BSIPs at the moment. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, John, I could do with talking to you um, about the ATCO board and and some documents. Um, before that board actually so uh, i'll drop you an email right or we could continue after this if you want oh yeah that might be better that might be better yeah yeah and then everybody okay. else can listen in on what we're trying to <laughs> um which is fine there's nothing secret okay so that was the minutes of the last meeting um heavy topic for today on bods um there's an awful lot going on um at the moment and has been over the last few months and there's going to be an awful lot more going on uh in the coming months um and um mr penn has been volunteered by um the dft to give us an update on on the state of play yeah volunteered is the word Tim. um just uh uh, you know, I'm not taking it personally, but you didn't give me the chance to introduce myself either, Tim. Oh, didn't um, I? Sorry, no. Steam. <laughs> that doesn't matter. I mean, I don't mean to gang up on Teresa either, but I left TFN several months ago, so the last minutes are not correct. I, I'm Stephen Penn at Infinity Works, uh, supporting the BOTS program, particularly on FAIRS implementation. Um, but yeah, um, as um, there's a bit of chit churn in the BOTS team, we've got some new starters who are here today who probably do this in future, and obviously Jan's on holiday, so like you say, I've been volunteered to do this presentation just uh let me get myself set up i'm assuming i've got sharing rights here do i tim yeah you do. yes you do 
Okay, I'm assuming we can all see that. Yes. Yeah. Um, apologies to anybody who was at the uh, the program board um, a couple of weeks ago because this is essentially just a rehash of that, um, you know, for efficiency's sake. Um, so what I'll do is I will quickly run through the um, I guess the sort of headline issues of the boss program. So let me just run through this this slide here, and then can we just sort of like save any questions to Dr. afterwards? Because um, it's I mean it's quite a meaty bit of information as you can see. Um, so I'll start with number one. Um, so as I've just mentioned, obviously we've got new starters. We've got we've got Triumph and Jess uh, who've been uh, joined the board team recently. There's another post uh, incoming, and there is also a focus on getting the sort of next uh, iteration of the NetEx Data Standards contract uh, sorted out. Um, in terms of policy, then there is going to be a review of the registrations process, um, uh, some some thoughts or discovery on disruptions uh, about what to do about the Sirius X tool that's there now, you know, how to scale it up, et cetera, and uh, finalizing the BODS implementation guidance. Um, so the focus of the BODS team uh, in the main at the moment is getting uh, timetable and location data quality, um, you know, more comprehensive, more standardized, and um, also doing UX into user research, into customer experience, the end-to-end -end customer experience of using BODS, and also NetX fair structures for data consumers. Um, onto the Create Fairs data service, uh, some new features have been added to that. Um, so users, you know, should they want to, can now define um, Carne Fairs and uh, Hopper style fairs. And we're looking at, you know, how we can, I guess, add the functionality for Plus Plus in quarter three of this financial year. Um, so I guess the, the main sort of, you know, I guess the, the most impactful thing at the moment is, is, is timetables and the, the, the PTI uh, validator, which has been launched. Uh, and as I'm sure a lot of you will know already, there is going to be uh, a lock essentially from the start of October where any new data that's published that doesn't meet this uh, PTI profile will not be published. Um, it doesn't affect all the data that's already there. It's all just about going forward, so obviously, to avoid any sort of cliff edge of uh, data supply. Um, with fares, I mean, I'm going to do a slightly, I've got a slightly separate fares presentation I can do later, but I guess the headline issue is that fixing ticketer. You know their main clients. We should be seeing them publish data first data sets through September. Like I say, I'll get into that a bit a bit more later on. Uh, locations data, Siri VM. Um, Seventy percent of ticket, ticket operators have published their AVL data. Nineteen thousand vehicles. Uh, punctuality. Um, to be honest, I'm not really that uh, in tune with the punctuality data, so I'll just read out what it says. Current focus on optimal servicing, punctuality data in open data formats. For developers, uh, bus stops. Uh, well, I'll, I'll open this. I'm sure Dr. J is doing a presentation. We'll talk about this later. But there are some local authorities that are yet to upload NAPTAN data into local level software. So um, I'll let Dr. J sort of elaborate on that later. In terms of onboarding and um, business change, 114 operators have so far published timetable data. Um, yet to receive, yet to publish AVL data, and these are all receiving an email. Um, I guess a prod, an email prod, and further to that, I guess that the more guilty operators uh, are getting a, a, an email from the OTC, those that are just not registered for bots or are not engaging whatsoever with bots, rather than sort of uh, you know being delayed. And so those that those have received an email from the DBSA. Um, evaluation, so the DX, the, the bots DX scorecard development continues, uh, focusing on metrics from people who are using the data downstream. Um, a data consumer strategy is being developed, so I guess that's obviously to, to, to improve take up of the data that's on BODS currently. Um, although, as we see in the next point, some some app developers, some services are using certain levels of BODS data, um, transit and move it, bus checker, and I'm pretty sure Josh, who bus time to always on this call, he's he's using it as well, I think, to some extent. Um, and for ABODS, the analyzed bus bus data service, obviously. There is a lot of development work going on that, uh, launching um, corridor functionality for analysis. And there are webinars coming in September, which Tim, I think you're helping facilitate. Um, and disruptions data, I mentioned earlier, there is obviously um, a sort of discovery, I guess, going on about how, how best to scale that service, because obviously it's transitioned over from transport off the north. Uh, so it's a purely northern data set in terms of geographic scope. So, you know, I've got to look at how that's going to be expanded. 
um, across local authorities outside the north and perhaps other types of organizations like operators because purely it's an LTA driven service at the moment. Um, for predictions, um, so I mean, I guess all of us said that the predictions is on the roadmap, but obviously the foundations need to be laid in terms of comprehensive timetable data and Siri VM data and links between the two in order to generate predictions. So the focus is on um, building the foundations first. And at the bottom, um, there is a BSOC digital rediscovery um, taking place in September, being led by new digital projects lead. So that's quite a lot. Um, I'll just stop there in case anybody has any questions before I proceed. Take that as a no, it's nice. Uh, so just as a sort of a look at some metrics. So I mean, obviously I guess the key the key figure is that there are 523 operators in scope of, uh, of the regulations. Um, so as far as timetable data is concerned, uh, that's over half, 287 published into pods. Um, I'm all walk off through all the figures. You can see them there. You know, 700 data sets on pods, um, etc. 7,000, nearly 8,000 lines. Location data again. You know, getting towards the halfway point. Uh, 256 feeds for 208 operators, and uh, last time it was measured, you know, nearly 18,000 um, vehicles on the road at the same time being detected, being published. So that's quite, that's you know quite a lot of progress. Fares data lagging behind. Um, only 51 operators have produced any fares. Most of them are small operators. There has been some um, data published by some ticketer. Um, clients, but mainly it's come from the Great Bears as I said at this point. I think you know we're hoping to see that change quite a lot in September. Um, and in terms of compliance, as we've said, there's obviously operators that are yet to register at all or are ignoring emails. And obviously they've been dealt with by DVSA and there've been emails chasing up people who have published routing timetable data but have yet to get um, you know AVL data published. So that's where um, that's where we are in terms of um, onboarding. Uh, service adoption. I mean, I, I won't go through the published data today, so that's kind of repeating things somewhat. Uh, but in terms of ABODs, um, so, you know, over half the users that have been invited have accepted. Um, 277 orders is possible uh, in total, so that's, you know, quite 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 a range. Um, operators and local authorities. I'm sure that figure will go up as the, uh, the webinars of September happen. Occupancy data. So obviously this is, um, you know, this is, this is something that probably has quite good value. You know, it's, it's a valuable data set, but it's not very widespread in its uptake because ultimately it's voluntary. It's not covered by the, you know, regulations. Um, so you can see that, you know, there's quite a lot of coverage, um, but it's all for one operator essentially, uh, the go-ahead group, who, who have obviously pushed forward with documents of data. Other operators are still slightly ambivalent about, you know, the pros and cons, the benefits, the disbenefits of sharing that data. So at the moment it's only go-ahead really. Yeah, those conversations with other operators are ongoing. Uh, GTFS conversion. So as we know, there is a integrated transfer model that you know ITO provide, which allows people to use um, GTFS should they want it. So at the moment, obviously, because BODS is you know far from comprehensive, you know a lot of it's being derived from TNDS data. So you can see the the pie charts there. Um, so yeah, TNDS dominating on the agencies. Uh, BODS you know taking over on the routes, but you know in terms of the trips. TMDS still uh, over 50%. I'm not sure if Julie has any comments on that at the moment. Is there a travel line update coming later, I guess? Yeah, all right, I'll move on. Um, shape analysis, so yeah, tracks, track data. Um, now this is, yeah, you know, there's, there's more of the trans exchange than there's the GDFS at the moment. Um, I think it's saying because Stagecoach, um, a very a very on point with their tracks data that they says skew, skews the data. Um, and there is some sort of problem converting into GTFS. Um, there is a statement here that, should, that it should improve over time with BODS PTI checks now in place. Although, um, obviously, I mean, Tim, I'm, I think I'm correct to say the BODS profile doesn't mandate tracks data, does it? So No, it doesn't. You know, yeah, so it's possible that, that that will never reach 100%, I guess, because it's ultimately voluntary, although it's strongly recommended, I believe, the, the wording is. Yeah, that's right. And uh, BODS coverage update. So, you yeah. know. A choice to show, a chance to show a nice fancy visual um, graphics. Not my thing, but there you go. <laughs> There's the coverage at the moment, all the routes in different colours. We can all admire. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, the bots update and where we are. Um, quite a lot to chew on. Um, 
Does anybody have any questions, please ask. I'll take that for now. Um, I, mean, I was going to do a first presentation as well before I was volunteered for the general boss presentation. Do you want me to do that as well, Tim? Or um, yeah, in a minute. I think it's probably worth picking up on on some of the the trans exchange, um, the the routes and timetables stuff. Um, so that there's a lot of focus at the moment in trying to get data suppliers to become compliant with the um, with the PTI. 1.1 profile um which has been recirculated um this week by the department um so it was set up this morning wasn't it, on the, on, to the bots to the mods email everyone on the bots email should have received the final version this morning by email yeah that's that's right that's right it's just because some people seem to have um uh, forgotten where to find it um most of the effort now seems to be just a case of um, having to um, just trawl through and republish data in the right format. Most of the data suppliers um, software is is up to date and capable of supplying compliant data sets. Um, and it's just a, it's just a grind now for for most operators to to republish the data. Um, there is, as I'm sure you're aware, going to be a block put on BODS for new submissions of data um, at the end of this month, which will mean that if you're not publishing in 1.1a, um, then you won't be able to upload. Uh, existing data sets for the time being will be uh, left, but there will be a process of um, encouraging those to be republished between the end of the month and, and the end of the year. Um, and at some point, data sets that aren't compliant with 1.1 1 .1, uh, will be cleaned from BODs so that data consumers know what they're going to get when they uh, when they take data from BODs. Um, and uh, and can understand it more easily. Um, there are still one or two little problems and, and, and challenges that people have got um, with interpretations of bank holidays. Um, bank holidays in the way that Trans Exchange understands them because Trans Exchange thinks Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve are um, bank holidays when they're, they're not, they're, they're a bit different and people early run off and, and do all sorts of um, uh, slightly different things. Um, so there's one or two um, challenges that people are having getting their heads around how to um, how to describe those properly in their um, scheduling systems and things like that. Um, are there any questions on the profile or, or the validator. How much are we going to lose, Tim, uh, as a result of the cutoff? Um, well, I think yeah, hopefully nothing, um, because the old <laughs> data will not be removed. So yeah, non, but... non compliant data is already there, will not be removed. Um, yeah, but, but in terms and... of going forward, how, 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 how many might not comply? What proportion, approximately? Well, well um, all, all of the all of the all of the major software suppliers are capable are capable of supplying compliant data. Um, there's one that's got a couple of little tweaks to to make um, to, to 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 sort out some some slightly weird um, edge cases, um, but all of the big five are capable of supplying data um, in 1.1a. Um, and so anything new going in after the end of the month will be okay. Um, and it's going to be a, um, as I say, a, a grind to get people to um, you know, republish. And, and that's why that's why David Batchelor from Ticket is not here. <laughs> 
um, pretty much all of their operators that they're providing services for have published um, already in um, in 2.1 Trans Exchange 2.1 they're now going through the process of um, getting those operators to publish in 1.1a profile um, and so it's a it's a time thing um, and as Stephen says hopefully nothing will be um, lost because those conversations about um, this data isn't compliant they're going to be going on at an individual operator level uh, if need be um, because nobody wants to see that data just disappear. Um, we want it to uh, to be available, compliant. But reality is, I I would expect that you know there will be a small number of um, operators or services that that won't be um, compliant um, by the time they're removed. But there's a lot of work going to be going on to make sure that that's as small a, a, a set of data as possible. Thanks. I'll just say, uh, Tim, I, th I think uh, the, the, the team at ETO are, are, are noting a lot of improvements coming through very rapidly now, so that's encouraging. Um, that there is quite a long way to go, but if the if the pace of uh, of improvements uh, continues during this month, then that will be very good. Yeah, yeah, good. That's good to hear. Hi Tim, sorry, I have got my hand up. I don't know if that's. Um, oh yes. Um, okay, just to add, um, I had a hand over uh, John Burtwistle, who chairs the APDI first group, um, was on holiday. I had a hand over him last week as I came back from leaving. He left. And at that point, the groups had all got their software pretty much ready, but rolling that out to each of the first group, 52 depots, and the stage group, X number of depots, and the go-ahead, is the thing that might take the time. So as yet, in Traveline, we haven't had a single file, apart from, from a couple of the agencies, producing the new stem for us to look at. So we've seen the work in progress, and we've seen the Trans Exchange 2.4, 1.1a that they're producing at the moment, but it's not quite ready to be published on board. So um, they've got three weeks to go, and they're reasonably confident it's going to happen. But I think that there is quite a big gap between the software supplies being ready and the schedulers being ready across, across, particularly across the big groups where they're much bigger, more disparate organisations. Yeah, no, that's 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 fair, and that's the conversations that I've been involved in as well. Um, and uh, and some of it comes down to logistics of. Um, we feed this other system with data that doesn't like Trans Exchange 2.4. So, how do we make it all work so we've got a minimal amount of efforts to to do um, within the depots? Um, so, yeah, no, there is still an awful lot of work to do, but uh, there's an awful lot of energy going on to uh, try and achieve compliance. Okay. Um, should we move on to Siri? Um, because um, at the moment, um, people can supply Siri. There's there's um, minimal checking going on at the moment. Um, there is a validator um, that is um, in development, and that will be um, put into acceptance testing and available for data suppliers to test um, at the start of October for a couple of weeks. Um, and so I'd encourage you to prepare to get ready for that um, and to start to make sure that um, um, you've got resources available to, to put data in and do testing and that sort of thing. Um, the the aim being to um, put that validator live at the end of October or fourth of November, um, either side of that sort of weekend. Um, with Siri, though, there won't be a hard a hard block like there is with Trans Exchange um, because it's much harder to uh, to do that and 
what we don't want to happen is whole um, operators disappear off because there's a bit of a problem with a couple of vehicles worth of feed and things like that. Um, but it's going to be a um, a, a reporting and a, and a flagging process um, where people have got um, uh, things that don't match the the profile um, in that data. So um, so there is you know, a month or so away behind um, Trans Exchange, but you know, as, as soon as people have got their head around Trans Exchange, you need to be thinking about. Um, Siri and, and and supplying that data and making it work. And um, as Nick said um, earlier on when he was um, introducing himself, um, making the data match between um, Trans Exchange and, and Siri, um, because that's when data consumers can really start to make a difference um, and produce good quality information for uh, customers on the street. Are there any questions about Siri? Uh, <clears throat> Tim, um, it's probably worth Jonathan Raper here from Transport API. Um, we've had to do that matching between Trans Exchange and Siri, you know, on an, on, on an industrial scale, and I think uh, everybody should expect there to be a very, very long tail of um, Compliance, you know, in terms of um, the Siri, the Siri VM. It, it, this is the point in time where you discover quite a few um, discrepancies with with route, routes and stops, particularly the first one or two stops. Um, it's also the place, um, you know, where you discover um, that there are um, some vehicles uh, with, without running boards or vehicles have been, you know reallocated between garages etc there's, there's there's a ton of issues um it's it's a it's a long long process and uh, I, I welcome you know the, the idea that it will be there won't be people won't be shut down because i don't think uh, the siri vm will ever be perfect it will be a constant process and i'd be interested in fact to know what the maintenance plan is um you know in terms of constantly dealing with all of those issues because we have you know like a, a whole dedicated activity um for that inside transport api uh, it just never ever stops yeah um you're right um there is um as part of the the bods um stuff uh, the the portal all of the reports and um um analysis available um and um that data ultimately um if people aren't providing it um in compliant ways either for trans exchange it's a it's a hard block and the data will be removed um and if it but if it doesn't match with the, with the siri and things like that it's a it's an otc compliance issue um and um the the work with operators to improve that data quality will get heavier and heavier over time um if there isn't the level of of matching that that the bods program would would expect um and the same will be with with fares and and i think that's 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 p potentially even harder to to get right um matching fares with routes and timetables um, just because people are less used to it than they are trying to get um, real time but you're right Jonathan there, there's an awful long tail of work to, to put in because every operator is going to have to put effort into journey matching. Yeah I mean the key point here is that this is where digital data starts to drive engineering and not the other way around because you know if there are a couple of buses that don't have the right um kit on or buses are being you know lent back and forward between different garages and so on that's just being one of those things as far as the data is concerned um whereas now it's gonna have to be the other way around um and you know in our experience that that then involves you know training it involves uh, unions it involves uh kit 
Um, so there's there's a there's a really long um, long tail, uh, and and it's it's really important that DFT understands that um, you know there's going to need to be constant maintenance of that. Otherwise, um, you know, we run the risk of the data quality being too poor for end users to commit. Uh, we, we found that when the accuracy of cross-referencing is in the 80s percent, then people start questioning whether or not it's really any good and whether it's any use. You've really got to be right up in the high 90s. But because of all this engineering um, and training and everything else that's got to be done, uh, it's really, really hard to drive that, that, that compliance. So just worth everybody being aware of the importance of, you know, the customer experience has to be good enough uh, otherwise, uh, all of this you know, pyramid of data aggregation doesn't, um, you know, doesn't deliver benefits. I'd absolutely, I'd absolutely endorse what Jonathan's just said. Yeah, yeah. So would I. So would I. We're just beginning this journey in reality. So, uh, okay. Um, so where, where does it fall down? Sorry, I was going to ask, where does it actually fall down? Is it when um, vehicles, the block numbers don't match up or the journey numbers don't match up? Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. Yeah, and, and they, the buses disappear. So the, the issue that you're gonna, you have is you can't differentiate between data loss and cancellations. Um, and that becomes that becomes an issue. So you've also got the, the, the other thing which um, we've got to do, which is to publish cancellations so that you can see that a particular service won't run. Because the bus industry currently, in effect, assumes that if a bus isn't showing a live feed, that people understand that it is cancelled. Um, but of course, positively, like like in the rail world, publishing you know the fact that the 1418 is cancelled before it departs then allows you to see what part of the um, you know the, da the data is due to data loss um, or even you know loss of um, feed so in some places uh, gps lock and the continuity of the location data is quite an issue and when it drops out for a certain period of time uh, you may lose the entire journey so lots and lots of things um, that, that, that have to be done before you can get it absolutely right hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, Stephen, do you want to pick up on fares? Yeah, just hold on, I was daydreaming. Um... Hoping you can all see that. So uh, yeah, just apologies again uh, for, for using hand-me-downs, but uh, this is the presentation I gave about 10 days ago to the uh, the ticket data ticketing technology group around the state's affairs at the moment, I guess the, the sort of immediate future. Um, so, I mean, I won't go too through that. You've seen most of these metrics already. I guess what I'd say is that, you know, for the first it has been published, a lot of data sets are actually just a single product rather than a product set. And most of the data sets at the moment there have come from the Great Fairs data service, not much from the ETM suppliers, only a few from Ticketer. Um, so that, you know, that was the same where we are. So just to look, you know, to, to look ahead slightly, um, you know, we've got two main ticket suppliers who are looking to produce, you know, to enable um, the production networks for the clients, uh, Bix and Stagecoach, this is a partnership. Um, so, you know, Stagecoach have sort of exported most of their fares data, but at the moment it's sat on their open data site and hasn't been published to boards just yet. Um, I think we're looking to see that in September. I think really the holdup is just some sort of internal business processes, making sure that, you know, they're the confident that what they're publishing is all right. Um, but that should be coming very soon. That's their entire stage cross network, so that's obviously a lot of data. Um, the Ticketer, um, you know, they've enabled their clients to export NetEx. They've sort of, um, you know, added the, the functionality in to resolve the whole um, fair stage question that was being dealt with a few months ago. Um, so really, again, you know, we're sort of expecting to see some ticket operators published in September. I know that first have published their first York division um, to bolts, but just haven't pressed the release button yet. So it's so it will be there in the next couple of weeks. Um, and then of course, you know, if you're not on Bix or Ticketer, or you, you know, you have products that sit outside that kind of uh, ecosystem, then the Create Fair State Service is there. That has a lot more functionality at the moment than the ETMs do. You know, in that you know they can define car.
Adrian, you've gone quiet, at least for me. Uh, I, uh, Stephen, sorry. That's okay. I was thinking it's gone quiet for me too, but then you mentioned my name and it confused me. But <laughs> Stephen, you're on mute. I, I can see Stephen's mouth moving a lot. He seems to be talking to us. Stephen, you've put yourself on mute. This is comedy gold that's going to go up on YouTube as well, isn't it? We could go viral with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can give him a quick phone call. Yeah, thank you. You do not have the authority. <laughs> Yeah, I can't unmute him. <laughs> there, is, there is a chance that he's just taking a phone call or something. No, he looks like <laughs> he's... He's realised. Yeah, Stephen, you're on mute. So okay, like he's, he's, browser he's not on mute. Right, if I mute you. Can I... Yeah, the old IT. Turn it off and on again. So he's back. Can I be heard? You can now, yes. Excellent. I don't, I, my microphone was saying I was unmuted the entire time. I don't know what was going on there. But um, <laughs> maybe I need to get the desktop client. The browser's not good enough. Um, OK, so that's a bit of a waste of everybody's time. Oh. Thankfully, people were telling me I was on mute on my phone. That wasn't paying attention. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you probably read all of this well, as I was um, miming away to you all. Um, you need I'll just to say... reshare, Stephen. Yeah, you I need, need to, to reshare. Yeah. yeah, all right. So, yeah. So, you know, I guess I won't go back to the first slide. I'll just, I guess, talk about, you know, what, what's going to be happening this month. I, guess, I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of Fair's data published in September. Um, you know, obviously the three main avenues through which it can be published. There are two main ETM suppliers working with the clients to enable, you know, their clients to publish NetEx. Um, you know, as far as VIX is concerned, obviously, you know, they're, they're partnered with Stagecoach. Um, Stagecoach have published a lot of their single operator, you know, products um, to their own open data website, but they're not published it to bots yet. Um, it's not been linked to bots. But we're expecting to see that in September. I think there are some sort of internal business processes, you know, sanity checks that they want to do before they publish it. But that's, you know, the NetEx is there and it's going to be published very soon. Um, for Ticketer, you know, they've enabled their clients to sort this stuff out. Um, you know, they've, they've fixed the issue around, you know, fair stages, the fair stage question about, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, the price can vary within fair stages depending on the sequence of stops. Um, and I think, you know, most of the major operators have updated their data to reflect that. Um, first, first have published um, data for their first Yorkshire division, um, but not pressed the, the sort of uh, release button yet. So I'm, I'm expecting to see that in the next week or two. Um, and then for any operators who are obviously outside the ticket of VIX um, ecosystems, and or perhaps they have fair products that sit outside their ETM system, you know, the Create Fair State services there. It has a lot more functionality, I guess, at the moment than the ETM suppliers do, in that it can do carnets and multi operator products and stuff like that. Um, and the BODS team are working, um, you know, the business change team are working with the smaller operators, getting them all onboarded, 
getting them to produce their first data, which is why you know there's a lot of small first data sets on Buzz at the moment because it's the small operators who are kind of leading the way at this point. Um, so, you know, this is what I was uh, riffing about on Silent. Um, there is a there is a piece of technical documentation that we're going to write because I guess what we're hearing back is you know the NetX at the moment is just far too variable, far too um, you know just messy if there's a lack of consistency about how things are being defined and expressed. So, you know, we're gonna, you know, the specification itself won't change. It's really just about documentation to to, to, to nail down exactly the elements we're expecting to see, um, you know, the values we're expecting to see in them as a bare minimum to at least create a minimum standard of, of data that will be on odds and the minimum sort of file structure. That should have been um, done last week, in fact, uh, but, um, we're a bit behind on that, but it will be circulated in February for people to um, feed back on, I guess. So if there's any interest, we can, of course, feed that um, to Tim, and I'm sure you can circulate around PTIC if there's an appetite for it. Yeah, I would have um, thought that would be sensible. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not my idea of fun to look at NetEx and guidance, but, I mean, if there is, uh, yeah. I, I, once it's ready, Tim, I'll make sure I send it to you, then you can uh, you know, circulate around the group and there's any feedback. And um, we'll be happy to sort of take that on board. Um, some of you may be aware that, I mean, J Jonathan probably will be, um, that we've been sort of talking to app developers and academics, you know, data consumers, uh, you know, about about NetEx and Fair's data in general, I guess, you know, about their, their appetite for it, the, the business model, the business um, cases that they have for it, and I guess what they'd like to see in the NetEx and any blockers that they've got. So obviously that's part of the reason why we're doing this documentation is to standardize the data because I think, you know, one of the main the main things that we hear is consistency is important. It's not necessarily the, the way it's done, it's the fact that everybody's doing it the same way. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the key call outs on top of that are obviously, as you would expect, there's an interest in the GTFS conversion. So when GTFS version two of FAIRS has come out, you know, maybe it should be mapped and converted. Um, we'll see that all align with the, the GTFS and GTFS RT that's being published by Bolt at the moment. Um, an interest, you know, I guess, there's not that much interest, I guess, at the moment in the sort of more esoteric products. It's very much focused on, you know, adult products, single dates, single trips and day passes, that sort of thing. And obviously there's a lot of concern around how it relates to the other data sets on BODs. So we'll be specifying how exactly that should be done and exactly the elements that should be used. Um, and then, of course, version control, which is an issue. And, you know, the PTI profile sets out how versions are going to be managed and revisions. And uh, so we'll be doing the same for, for the NetEx files as well. Um, and I guess looking at I guess the more uncertain things, you know, there's multi operator products, multimodal products, I guess in the in the roadmap, and uh, you, you know there are some challenges still to be overcome there, I guess, in terms of who's responsible for publication and all the extra data capture that's going to be needed um, to achieve multi operator bus tickets plus bus and trams and that sort of thing. Uh, but they are a key part part of the national bus strategy and the BSIPs, so you know they need to be addressed at some point, and that will that will happen in the next few months. So yeah, that's about me for Fez. Uh, sorry for holding everything up by uh, muting myself. It's all right, these things happen. Um, any questions for Stephen? No? Not a, no. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Jonathan. I was gonna say, just not, not a question um, so much as a, a comment, which is, um, we have an API now that allows you to um, explore the NetEx data. Um, you can, if you if you submit two ACTO codes, it will give you back um, the uh, um, the fares, all the fares are available in the NetEx data. Um, so, if anybody is interested in um, having a play with that, uh, please get in touch with me, um, and we'll let you let you have a play with it. And obviously, that, that will that will become more and more. Uh, useful as more and more data is is loaded, uh, and that will that will become an, a new managed service that, that we offer in due course. But we'd be interested in getting feedback on it and improving it. Um, and so, anybody is interested, get you get in touch with me, Jonathan Raper at transportapi.com. Yeah, I, I, I've used it, Jonathan, and it is very simple to use. So, if anyone is interested, I'd encourage them to do so. Okay. I think there was a comment from Mark as well about circuit and slides. Mark, specifically, do you mean the fair slides or you meant the, the BODS program update slides? Or just all of them? A lot. Okay. Hello. 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure we can manage that. Uh, I'll give it to Tim afterwards and then he can uh, circulate through the usual channels. Yeah. Okay. So. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I think that's it for BODs. Thank you, Stephen, for that. Um, the um, other major bit of work that the DFT are doing that involves data is uh, bus stops and NAPTAM database. Um, and so um, Dr. J and Adrian are going to um, give us an update on where they are with that project. It's not just bus stops, Tim, but yes, we're going to update you. <laughs> yeah on that um you won't be surprised anyone that's been to the public meetings won't be surprised we have a mural board uh which i'm hoping is sharing can you see that oh it's gone really small it's yeah you have to bear with me while i get familiar with go to meeting um okay can you see that move and can you see that okay yes we can okay I've lost you, so if hands go up, I can't see, but you can uh, you can let me know. So I just wanted to go do a very quick demo of of the new service that we've been building, just so people can see the progress that we've made. Um, talk through some of the issues that we're having with the old service and how that might be impacting uh, what people are able to get out of the either the, we call it the old or the existing service. We're sort of in between names at the moment because uh, we've got the old one and the new one. Uh, and then just talk about the timeline for some of the changes that we're hoping to make this year uh, and to get people's feedback on on, on that. Um, so that's what I was proposing to do, about 10 minutes, if that's okay of your time. So in terms yep. of a, de a demo, um, we have made a very, very simple website um, for people to download NAPTAN data. We're not looking at the upload part of the process at the moment. We're taking all of the data from the current NAPTAN. Uh, we're actually taking it a day ahead of it coming into the current NAPTAN, we get it as soon as it lands rather than taking a day to process it. So we're actually taking the data in and we've got it available now in the new service. Um, we've we've made three pages on the website. Uh, so, and these pages are all sort of, uh, you know, accessible, responsive. So th th this is a, you know, fully functional, um, fully sort of professional uh, site that our private beta users are using at the moment. And effectively we've got two Two, two things that we allow people to get to on, on the new site. So one is to access all of the stop data in either a CSV or XML format. Um, and that's everything, you know, the entirety of the data set in one go. Uh, or alternatively, we're getting people to, people can look at getting the data just by local authorities. So however people might want to cut that up, is that one or is that 10 or, or however they might want to do that. Um, and as I said, the pages are very simple. If you want the full thing, at the moment we've only got CSV, the XML will be coming in at, at hopefully some point this week actually. Um, but the, the download's available, it's just that the, the page isn't, is, isn't finished. This is what you see right now. But at the end of the week, you'll be able to go into the national page and choose between CSV and XML and download all of that. Um, and then if you wanted to get something by local authority, there's, there's a two-step process. You can add in the local authorities that you want to uh, use, and uh, you can um, select the file type that you want, and that will give you uh, all of the data that you need that you've selected. I would show you on the on the actual beta site, but uh, we haven't actually password protected it. It is open, uh, and I don't want to publicize the URL yet because we still are in a private beta. Uh, so there's just a few screenshots of the site. Um, but hopefully that's quite straightforward uh, and when people get to use that it's not going to cause too many issues um i'll pause there for any questions at that point before i go into some of the issues that we're seeing with the old site okay cool um so the, the site adrian i was just going to make Sorry, I was just going to make one comment. Um, mm -hmm. It's slightly different to the current site in that when you download CSV, you get the stop CSV and not oh, the yeah. 17-zip files. Um, I've, I accidentally messaged that privately to Tim while trying to say that publicly. <laughs> I have no idea of how to use GoToMeeting either. 
So actually, Jay, there's, do you know, there's two points that are really important to make that one. So we've only provided the stop CSV. So if you download the XML, you'll get everything because everything's included in the XML. If we download the CSV, we used to provide the zip file with 17 files in. Uh, and we've actually found that only one of them was really used, which is the stop CSV. So that is the only one that we're providing at the moment. If people do need other ones, we can provide them. But as we'll come on to in a second, there are a few issues with quite a few of those. And a lot of them haven't actually been updated in quite a while. <laughs> And so I think if you were trying to use one of those files, it would probably be worth a, a chat with us to see if it's one of the ones that hasn't been updated and we can perhaps see what we can do to help you with that. And then actually, secondly, uh, and the question we often get is, will we still be able to access the information through a URL? Uh, and we actually, we've, we've replicated that. So slightly changed process. We haven't got pipes, we've got commas. Um, and again, if that's something that you're interested in, then we will provide more information on the site on how to do that. But um, also you, you can always come and talk to us, but you will still be able to download the information through a URL um, as perhaps a lot of you do with automated systems at the moment. Um, so in many ways, we've tried to recreate a lot of the key things that people um, need to, to be able to uh, do with what you're doing in Naptan. Um, one final thing, we are providing, if you download the full data set or a, comb a combination of local authorities at one time, you'll get the data in version 2.4. Um, if you download just one single authority at the moment by itself, you'll get the version that the local authorities provided us with. And currently, some people are using version 2.1, some are using 2.2, and some are using 2.4. So we validate against whatever's been sent across. But to be honest, we're, the overall aim is that we'd like people to move over to 2.4 where possible. Um, we're not insisting on that at the moment, but I think the further down the line we get, it's going to make things easier if we could all use the same standard, the same scheme of version, sorry. Um, okay, so I'm assuming people are familiar with naptan.app.dft.gov.uk, and some of you may go there to get data. Um, some might have not been there in a while, but when we're talking about the current site, these are that's the sort of thing that we're talking about. Um, we've had a number of issues with um, the data. It's a very, very old system. We've, we've find it increasingly hard to support. Um, and, you know, we made some changes. We put a survey on the site a few months ago. You might notice it's still there. Uh, in the process of doing that, we took down the site for a couple of days and, and we struggled to get it back up. Um, I, I can't really stress how old and creaking the, the current service is, which is why we're, we're quite keen to, to try and move, move away from this as soon as we can. Um, so we've, we've tried to update some data for, for Durham and tried to add in um, a train station in Peterlee. Um, uh, however, we couldn't get that into the CSV. It, only, it would only go into um, the XML. And so we, you know, we've been unable to make that change um, in, in the current data set. If you access it through the new site, that's not a problem. And so we've had issues with um, updating data manually. Um, so some of the nine stop uh, the 900 stops, um, the centrally managed stops, and some of the stop areas, um, and we're not we've we found it difficult to add in new 900 stops. So we've we've had to bring TFL into the private uh, into the private beta so that we could correctly get the um, ferry stops at Hammersmith um, added properly and, and in a way that works for them. Um, we know there are two Heathrow airports. Um, that, well, we know there are two Heathrow airports in Naptan. There aren't actually two Heathrow airports. Um, and we've recently discovered some some issues with how the coach references and plus plus are working, particularly around actually not being updated in quite a while. Um, and then finally, some of the data that we've been provided in Naptan, for example, um, the location. Um, actually, there was what we found that we actually were doing a calculation. So if we were only given one of the coordinates, we were calculating the others. But actually, sometimes these were, the calculations were quite wrong. Um, and so we've not replicated the process of, of duplicating those calculations in the new version of the service. Uh, we, we're just providing the data that we have ourselves been provided by, by local authorities. We're not calculating anything. So those are some of the changes and issues that we've been having with, with the current service, um, which has got us to the point where just for the download, we'll come to upload um, late, um, at a later point for now, but we really want to focus on on trying to get as many of you over to using the new site as possible, uh, as quickly as possible, because it's, you know, the data set is increasingly becoming degraded on the old service and it is fine on the new service. Um, and once we get you, once we get everybody onto the download, it will make it easier for them to, for us then to tackle the upload. Um, so we wanted to, um, 
I just wanted to put out a, a suggested timeline or our thoughts on on how quickly we'd like to try and move on this um, just to get feedback um, we haven't really tested this with any audiences yet so this is just our first sort of uh, pitch of what we think might be feasible um, given what we know through the conversations that we've had with people uh, but it'd be good to hear um, how people feel about this and, and perhaps any issues that they perceive. Uh, we have to pass a service assessment as a government thing um, at this, and we're hoping to do that at the start of October. Um, we have failed one of these before so it's quite possible we could fail this again. Um, hopefully not uh, but you know the, none of these things are certain but subject to that going okay we'd like to open up the private beta into a public beta so that all of you be able to access the data in in late october 2021 um and then once we've got people using that and, and if things are fine we'd like to start to close down the download part of the old service at the end of the year um and then once we've done that it, it will hopefully gives the opportunity to restart really to improve some of the data quality issues that we've had with stops so the non-bus stop mm. information could really be improved there's a lot more potential to to make that better quality data um, certainly some of the things that um, have been in dft's remit i think there's potential to improve train stations and, and that sort of thing fix the heathrow issue um, we don't really want to do that on the old site because it, you know it's, it's too difficult for us to to tamper with with that old service um, but then there are also other issues that we found i think there's about seven thousand stops that have got the created date after the modified date um which you know things like that will be a barrier for us doing other interesting things in the future like being able to show um what's updated and when when people upload files rather than having to uh, uh um, sort of download the file every week just in case something has changed and those sort of things so there's a, quite a few data quality issues like that that we'd like to come and talk to you and try to see understand how we how we can fix to enable uh, new features to be added to the service in the future so um, that's our proposed timeline uh genuinely don't know how how that feels for people so it'd be good to get some feedback on, on, on what people think about that uh, and stop for any questions mm. thank you adrian um any thoughts on those timelines i can stop sharing so i can see you mm. if you're a nap time data consumer what do you think about shifting by the end of the year to the new site is that feasible practical we don't anticipate any problems with doing that we we've, we've tried the beta and it seems like it's going to work fine for us cool. excellent <laughs> didn't see who that was actually so who said that so, sorry this is chris uh, from passenger um yeah we, we we've used it to be honest we we just uh, we don't use the website we just use the url and we download it nightly so um the only comment i did have which i raised in the naptan beta was that the uh, the local one is is handy um, but because it's a form you have to post there's no url public url for us to just um call to get that to get the data for the specific authority that we want so we just have to download the whole lot like we usually do yeah we we have a way of doing that chris um and possibly i could pass on the details after the call um that'd be handy thank you yeah okay cool yeah mark taylor oh hi um i'd like to be able to access the stop areas and the stop hierarchy the stop area hierarchy as well which were part of the zip file oh, i'd like to be able to get them in excel format easily yeah certainly if you try using the the xml it's a mm -hmm. it's a devil's job to work out which stops are in what yeah so that's the, unless the you've got areas. some easy method sorry unless you've got some easy method of um obtaining data from xml files which you can easily bring them into Excel. I'll, I don't know how to easily. Sounds out of my depth, to be honest, Mark. But I wonder if I, if, yeah. if you'd mind if I pick it up with you after the meeting sometime next week, maybe just to understand which files you've been using and how. how yeah, sure. I haven't got the zip file in front of me, so I'm, I'm not sure which ones are which. But yeah, yeah. Speak That'd next week. Yeah. Brilliant. I'll shut up. <laughs> cheers, Mark. Not cheers for shutting up, but thanks for the comment. Sorry. <laughs> 
Uh, um, also, I was going to say. Sorry, I was going to say thanks to Mark for being so responsive on making some of the changes um, in their data because we found some errors that were coming through across the systems when we checked them against the new um, schemas. So, and Mark made some very, very quick changes for us. So I, I was just going to say thank you very much for doing that. You're not supposed to tell anybody I made some mistakes, though. <laughs> That's Sorry. just between you and me. You didn't, you didn't make mistakes. <laughs> mistakes happened. I, just somehow, I, magically I, always, I make plenty of mistakes. Yeah, you're right. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's it, fine. That went very smoothly. Yeah. I mean, we've been we've been checking the files against the 2.1, 2.2, and 2.4 schemas, and, and so we've noticed some things that the current NAPTAN service wouldn't have been able to pick up because it hasn't been checking those things. So we've been going back to people as we've noticed them, the sort of quirks from from not implementing the 2.4 schema. But your checks picked up something. I just was gung ho and went straight in outside of the existing software, which you should never do. But I was a big head and thought I knew what I was doing and cocked it up. Oh, I see. I didn't realise that. Yep. So <laughs> see, Mark, I hadn't human. told anyone until you just did. No, I've. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Dan and then Mike. Uh, I'll say yes. So yeah, I think October. You're very quiet, Dan. Sorry about that. Is that any better? No. Okay. Oh. Oh, uh... Right. Let's try Mike. Hi there. The... Uh, yeah, I was just, I just wondered, have you got Vixen on the um, private? I presume this is a private beta. They, they are, because I know that. The, um, the data management system that they use, there's various calls and stuff that are probably hard coded to the existing NAPTAN um, infrastructure, if you like. Yeah. yeah, I see Dr. J is putting the thumbs up. So, yeah, we, we I, brought them in. They weren't in at the start, but we brought them in. We're scheduling meetings for everyone in the beta in the next two weeks. So, hopefully, we'll pick yeah. up any issues if, if people got them to report. Do you know who, who from VIX is, is dealing with that, or is that? Justin, I want to say. Justin Bloom, no, okay, yeah, 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 yeah sure, no worries. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll try that again. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, that's always a good start. Yeah, uh, October sounds absolutely fine for us. We've been downloading uh, and using some of the beta stuff already, and we start looking at the XML, we're loading that fine for all of our systems, so we're quite confident with that. Um, and we'll also update any static links, because I think we found a link uh, with Adrian recently that. Uh, no one ever knew existed it was about 10 years old but somehow was still working and downloading the latest status so that was a that was interesting we we have got redirects on redirects on redirects on the existing service uh, yeah which dan pointed out when we met him last week which is a bit of a shock to all of us <laughs> okay any more on that tan thanks everyone i'm going to dash if that's okay um, but you have my details if there's any questions you want to ask I'll find. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you, Adrian. We've got another couple of um, working groups um, coming up on NAPTAN um, over the next few weeks. Next one's the 16th of September. Um, so um, have a look on the... Um, PTIC site um, or on the emails when they come out um, for the instructions on how to join those. Um, and um, Dr. J will take us through the next um, stages of her um, nefarious plans to rule the uh, the world of, uh, of public transport stops. OK. Um, in which case, um, we'll move on to Julian Travelline and find out what uh, been keeping her busy over the last few months. If you can imagine. Okay, so I'm showing that I'm speaking. Am I speaking? You are speaking, yes. Excellent. I just thought I'd do that before we start. Because when Stephen was speaking earlier, it showed on my browser that he was on mute, even though he was speaking. So there we go. Ah. Um, I appreciate the vindication, Julie. Thanks. Love the go-to meetings interface. Um, 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is give you a quick update on TNDS, which I think is quite relevant to some of the figures we saw earlier, and some of you might be slightly concerned about what might happen to it. Um, I'll go through Plus Plus because that now falls within what we do, and the Plus Plus directors and the TL directors are all the same board. And then I'll just talk a little bit about how we're going to bring those um, services together and what we're going to do in the future. Um, so on the TNDS, we've had a 25% increase in people logging in to use and registering to use our services in the last year. So um, it's been great to see that BODS has got people talking about using open data for bus. Um, we have currently 16,000 lines live in the TNDS, which compares to the uh, just under 8,000 that are on BODS. But of course, that includes for us um, all the small operators in Wales and in Scotland as well, um, and ferries and, and various other things. So it's just slightly over double what's on um, BODS currently. Um, we've also done some work where our supplier, Dan, is on here for Basemap, um, to look at who, what sort of data they're using from TNDS. So we currently publish in 2.1. We've been doing that for years. We don't use it. Other people find it really useful, um, so we carry on doing it. It does represent a resource to us in that it, we can't um, publish in parallel. We have to do that, and then we have to do the 2.4, 2.5. So looking at people who are downloading the 2.1 versus the 2.4, 94% of our users are only using 2.1. So that leaves 6% using uh, 2.4. That doesn't include our own supplier, Silver Ale, and um, that they're taken out of that equation. So although we've had 2.4, 2.5 live for seven or eight years, I would say, only 6% only of our users are, doing, are using that and consuming that. So I think that's got quite an interesting step when you look at the 2.1. I mean, I agree that BODS needs a hard end date, but you know there are still consumers, including it so well for Apple and Google, including First Group, including uh, Microsoft, including Wiki Travel, Wiki Maps, who are still taking 2.1. So we're just um, undergoing some research with them to try and find out if it's because they haven't got around to moving to the 2.4, 2.5 yet, or if they just don't have the capability to do that yet. So I think that will be an interesting one, um, and that's something we've been planning to do for some time, but we've needed an end, we, we've needed a definite decision by BOD of when they're going to change and what they're going to do. So we now know there's this hard lock at the end of September, so we know what will happen after that on BOD. Um, so we can start saying with some certainty to our open data users, well, what do you plan to do? Um, we would like to carry on providing data in 2.1 for as long as we can. We just need to make sure we've got the funding to do that and we can justify doing that. I don't think that's going to be difficult, but we will need to update that piece of software, that import, to be able to take the data in 2.4, 1.1a, which we haven't done yet. So that's kind of how many people are using TNDS. Um, in terms of um, logins, we have about 25,000 logins a month. Um, and those people who log in are taking 50,000 plus files a month um, from BODS. And that's um, regional files, that's not individual bus services. So those are regional folders. That's a lot of data being, being consumed. Um, within TNDS, we've already integrated first data and stagecoach data for the whole of England, Scotland and Wales. So that's in the, for first group, it's in Trans Exchange 2.1, which is their current operational version. And that's one single file per depot. Um, we strip that out, separate it out into single services and convert it back into 2.1 and 2.4. The stagecoach, they already publish in 2.4 EBSR format, and we are using that data in TNDS. So the TNDS versions that you see um, that are live and published at the moment, our service report will tell you whether the data is published by the LA or by the operator so that you can see exactly what the source is. As soon as we start taking data from BODS, when we make the decision to do that, um, which will be dependent on two things. One is the quality of data on BODS, and two is the um, ability for the local authority or the permission, if you like, to stop providing that data to us. Um, then we will we will be bringing the 2.1 data into BODS and showing BODS as the supplier on our service list. So it's very clear to all our open data users what the source of the data is in every case and what the data that source is. Otherwise, you're just kind of working blind. So we've got no intention of stopping letting other people use the TNDS, and we don't have any notifications from any local authorities that are going to stop providing data. Even in the southeast region where they had some resource issues, they appear to have resolved that. So there's no end date that we can see where local authorities are going to stop providing data to us. Um, once the 2.4, 1.1a data is stable for the next biggest operator, we'll bring that into TNDS and sort of do it one at a time. We uh, in theory, once we can import one version, one operator's data set of 
the new format. We should just be able to automatically do the rest because it's going to be so good. So I'll just leave that um, and we'll just see how long that takes for us to do it. But the plan is to gradually integrate all the operator data and it, it does take some time to do that because it doesn't always work first time, which may not surprise most of you on the screen. Um, looking at what we're doing with um, some of the operators are looking at their fares day. So quite a lot of them have got their NetEx fares, and this is from the operators on our board. They have reported to us, they have got their fares working in staging on NetEx, which is what Stephen's reported earlier. But I think there are a couple of bugs with getting that into production. So both first group and stage coach have seen different bugs that have been called up in the BODS process for publishing the data that weren't, weren't there in staging. So I do think it's all moving in the right direction, but I think it's important to know the bug is not with the operator in these cases, these two cases certainly, it's with the BOD, BOD system. So I, I think we sometimes forget um, at this meeting to, to sort of mention how much work the operators are putting into trying to make this data right with very changing, um, you know, ever-changing standards and BSIPs coming in and then having to re-register all their services in January. There's a huge amount of work for them to do in this, in this last quarter of uh, 2021. So um, on Plus Bus, we had exciting news last week. We had approval from all the tops at their fares group to um, go ahead with our barcode rollout for Plus Bus daily and weekly products across the UK. So the status of that project is that we have a ticket produced, we have a GWR produced a barcode ticket for Plus Bus in test, and that has been validated successfully by Ticketer in the West of England partnership. That partnership will be used as a blueprint for how we roll that out across the UK. So the next stage technically on the rail side is that we need to change the barcode standard for rail tickets to allow for the product being a flashcard as well as being validated electronically. That's because um, many buses will not have the kit to validate these tickets. Um, so there'll be flash passes and we've, we've shown the first couple of versions to some album members and the next version that comes out will be the almost final version that has to go through RDG validation. So that validation includes all of the rail retailers, um, as any change to a rail standard does. And one of the things we're pushing for is a different colour background so that you can tell it's not a rail ticket straight away. At the moment, the text is so small on the barcode, on the magstrap tickets that it's quite difficult to see that it's a plus plus ticket from a distance. So we weren't expecting, RDG at the beginning said that we couldn't have flash passes. Um, but we have pointed out that the risk, revenue risk is on bus, not on rail. So it kind of blows that argument out of the water in a sense. It's actually the bus people, you know, they're, they're taking the revenue risk and they're willing to do that. So we expect the technical work on the rail standard to be finished by December, the end of December this year. Um, and then we will be able to, um, the way that it rolls out is that RDG puts all of the barcode ticketing and enables it in the rail retail engine. Um, then the TOX or RDG on their behalf literally switches it on station by station, the ability to retail for that station. So there are 280 um, stations that are in the, or well, 280 plus plus zones with at least one station within them. So we will make sure that the coordination of rollout means that locally we are giving driver training. Um, TIL is going to manage the driver training packs and there's going to be a, a marketing pack as well that they can all use. Um, RDG is going to make sure the ticket staff ticketing staff at the stations um, and all those support staff are trained in how to use these tickets and how to give advice. So it's it's quite a big logistical exercise, but we do now understand that we're going to have the ability to coordinate that and it doesn't just get switched on in blanket terms. When we've done our first two big ones, we probably will do some publicity. But there's a bit of a, you know, my personal view is I'm not sure if we should be saying, well, we can do barcode when everyone else has been doing it for 10 years. So maybe we should be saying that internally because it is quite a big achievement, it's never been done but we should also be just improving the publicity we already have on our website and to our customers saying, you can get this by barcode, you can get it on your phone. And we hope that the retailers will be interested. We've certainly had some very positive noises from um, retailers like Trainline, who would be at least 50% of our sales were they to sell the barcode tickets. So Plus Plus is all looking really positive. It's moving ridiculously quickly um, and it's quite challenging to kind of keep it all moving at the same pace. Travelline Futures will be looking at how we um, bring together what we do with Travelline and what we do with Plus Bus and what we're doing with Good Journey, which is promoting the use of public transport. So currently we have uh, the Travelline Journey Planning widget sits within the Plus Bus website, badly, it's, it's a really old site, it's very orange, 
Um, the first thing we'll do with that website is just smile it up, change the colours and just tighten up the branding a little bit. And then there'll be a round of looking at both our websites and either bringing them together or making sure that they look like each other and offer similar functionality with Plus Boss being very much multi-operated ticketing um, sort, of, sort of highlighted. Whereas on the, on the travel line side, it could be more journey planning with a ticket rather than tickets with a journey plan. Um, We've got a surprising number of TOX and bus operators who are really interested in having wider area plus bus passes to bring some of their other multi-operator ticketing products under the plus bus brand. Um, this will need changes or improvements to the clarification on the ticketing exemption block rules because currently you can't buy a plus bus ticket between two stations in the same zone. But were the ruling to change on that, we could make bigger zones. And you could have a plus bus and a plus bus discover, if you like, sitting outside of that, um, for example, for Cornwall or for some of the larger areas of the South East. So that's something that will happen at a local level. We, we can't make that happen. We aren't the scheme coordinators and we don't own those zones. They have to be managed through that piece of legislation that I just mentioned. But we can help coordinate it and we can brand it and we can make sure that it's usable. So, you know, from a product when we took it over that we were kind of expecting not to have much interest from operators and TOPS. It's not like that at all. As soon as we've pr proved that we can do a barcode ticket, then it changes everything. Um, particularly when you look at the um, Williams Shapps report and the National Bus Strategy that mentions plus bus and multi operator ticketing. I think it's a real proof that people do want to work together and when you get the right people around the table, you can uh, achieve these things on a national scale. Um, although it's complicated, it's not impossible. Somebody told me this wasn't possible and for me that's that's well, why would I not want to do it then? <laughs> That's a really silly thing to say. Um, we may have an app, we may not, but those um, thoughts about what we spend our money on in the future and what we do will have to wait until next year because all of our partners and us, we're just so busy delivering pods um, this quarter and probably the beginning of next that we can't really take our eye off that particular ball. So that's it, that's it. Has anybody got any questions? Can't see any hands up. No, any questions? No. Yeah, you've you've achieved a lot, Julie, with Plus Bus. It's it's amazing the uh, the pace of change given what's happened over the last ten years. Thank you. I think it just needed somebody to sit down and put it all in one pot instead of having it in lots of different ones. And mm. CIO has been able to do that, so yeah, really pleased. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so um, next, um, we've there's a bit of work that um, Artig is doing with Transport for Wales that it is worth um, making you aware of um, because uh, it will end up with a standard. Um, so. Um, we are um, working with Transport for Wales, who are um, about to go out to tender in the next few months um, for um, a Welsh equivalent of the Bus Open Data Service, um, which will include a real-time engine um, and a central content management system to manage um, content for displays and a framework so they can go out and buy displays to put on street. Um, and um, they would like to try and get to the point where there is at least a basic interface between content management system and the on street displays um, so that they only need to um, manage the uh, core information at least on displays in one place rather than um, having to go to lots of different content management systems to put in uh, messages and, and things like that um, and um, they'd like to be able to do this across their whole um, suite of bus stops, so all 25,000 um, and their existing 600 um, displays, if possible. Um, 
but the focus really is is on new displays um, at the moment. Um, Artig's done some previous work on it um, in 2015. Um, we put together a interface specification. It's not actually the technical interface. Um, it, it says talks about the the principles of what would need to be um, in that technical interface um, and some guidance on um, the sort of information you might want to put onto displays. Um, and um, having been talking to uh, local authorities that have got display networks existing and looking to procure over the next couple of years, um, there's quite a lot of interest from um, authorities in England as well as um, the, the work that Wales is, uh, is wanting done. So um, whereas in 2015, RT couldn't quite get to the point of having enough buy-in from people to actually achieve um, a standardised interface, um, it feels like there's perhaps a bit more um, impetus behind it this time um, and therefore more chance of uh, of getting there um, and um, what they're wanting to do in Wales is to um, look at displays in in three ways there's the um, basic text-based display so the the traditional three line um, type display that can only produce text um and you know put countdown times on for a bus and and display some text messages and and that sort of thing um and um you know, perhaps it will hold um the current day's timetable in case it loses communications and and that sort of thing then you've got graphical displays so displays that build on top of the capabilities of the um text based displays uh, you might be able to partition a bit of the screen um, and put an advert on it or put some news information on it or put weather forecast on it, that sort of thing. You'll have all seen them both in bus stops, um, you know, some that, that sort of the same sort of size and shape as, as an early traditional LED one, but also the bigger, more, you know, advertising type displays that, that you might see. So graphical displays and then um, what we're calling off-grid displays so those that don't need um, to be plugged into mains power that might be e-ink that might be um, TFT or LED but it doesn't need plugging in because it will be powered by solar or battery of some sort um and uh you know, that's bro they're broken out because they have a different set of requirements to make sure that their power management is is very well controlled to be able to cope with not having a, a main supply so we're looking at displays in in those three types um and um we're going to be looking at what we need to do for um the basic real time content distribution for the text-based displays to start with um, what we need to do to get messages out there so that might be cancellation message it might be um, a diversion message um, that might be um, an advert type message but text-based that you might see typically scrolling along the bottom of, a, of an led display um, and then we'll look at um, graphic distribution um, later on. But the initial focus is is both is the real time content, the message distribution, and then um, how do you know whether the display is working? Uh, can you see um, whether it's online or not? Um, has it got something wrong with it that it can report to us? um to say you know i'm overheating if it's a sunny day or um part of my uh, display has stopped working that sort of basic fault management um initially as i've said 
concepts for new displays, but um, you rapidly get to the question of how do we use this for existing displays um, to, to really achieve the purpose of only being able, only needing to go to one place to put in a message, for example. So um, in terms of where this work is, um, there was an initial workshop last month. Um, there's another one um, in just under two weeks time. Um, no, just over two weeks time, two weeks and a day, um, which will start to look at things in more detail. So the first workshop was introduction to, to what's trying to be achieved and does this feel as though it's possible um who might be interested in it that sort of thing this next one's going to start to look at it in a bit more detail um and some of the um um things that we might need to include in there um and security and, and that sort of thing um and the aim being that by the end of um, this calendar year, we've got the basic text interface um, going. Um, we understand what that looks like and people know how to um, work with it. That's documented so people can go away and implement it um, and a plan for um, where we go next. So uh, how do we then go on and include um uh, graphical content and what else can we do you know could we include interfaces for the sort of sensors that people are increasingly putting onto displays you know air quality um that sort of thing um and so that's that's the sort of that's where we're going in the sort of time scales um if you want to get involved um, have a look on the Arctic website at the events and you'll find out how to sign up for that. Um, has anybody got any questions about that? Jonathan? Yes. Uh, well, it's really just an, uh, um, it's an observation, really. Um, if BODS is going to start providing predictions nationally um i'm wondering about the capacity of the bod system to service all these new cms systems um because you know the the you know money wants to be free or whatever the expression is um you know if there's a free service everyone will want to use that free service in time uh, and to load the um the processing um effort onto onto that source and i think of course that will influence the decisions that the welsh government takes so i just wonder if dft has actually modeled the market dynamics of providing a free service um into the medium term and what that does in terms of suppliers innovation and all those other elements that that go along with um with, with that kind of um, government intervention yeah um, I don't think they have at the moment, um, but Theresa, if we can take an action um, f to uh, talk to um, Bod's team about what work has been done, um, because I think that's a fair point, Jonathan. Um, this Wales work will, at least initially, um, be plugging into the Wales um, back office that they're procuring. They're not part of um, BODS um, per se, although there'll be quite a lot of Welsh services in there. They're, they're doing their um, own version of it. Um, and so they'll have to cope with that. But you're right, in time, once people get to grips with this, then actually it could become quite a lot easier to um, uh, get access to real-time data to put onto displays of all sorts. I mean, there are some very good, um, you know, small innovative companies entering the CMS space, mm. like uh, Passageway and people like that. Um, but if it's if it's free, they'll just they'll just hit the source, you know, 
every 10 seconds, every five seconds. Um, and I, I haven't seen any analysis or thinking about how to um, rate limit access to those free services. Um, you know, it seems to be a bit of mission creep on BODs, which, you know, I understand how they've got to where they've got, but that mission creep um, where they're starting to provide a lot of additional services, it needs a resourcing plan and it also needs, you know, to understand what it will do, as I said, to the to the market dynamics um, in terms of the long longer term. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, j just using this presentation about the Welsh government, who who have an opportunity to you know think differently, um, you know, to to just think out loud about you know what 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 will happen because it it, it looks really as if BOD will become a comprehensive aggregation platform. Um, not not just a library, but a comprehensive platform, um, publicly funded and free at the point of use, up to you know presumably. So, well, is is there going to be a limit of, of access to it? I've not heard of anything so far. So, um, I, I think this group should probably think about you know what, what its position on that should be. Yeah, yeah. So certainly. Wales will have their own and the local authorities that I've talked to um, that have been expressing an interest in getting involved in in this work, they all run their own prediction engine back offices and content management systems that, that would potentially use this interface. Um, so I, I'm not sure that there's an immediate crisis there looming as a result of this work, but it downstream I can see how that might happen I mean everybody I mean obviously there are some some very large groups um, Vix and Trapeze and others who have very sophisticated prediction engines um, and you know highly likely to outperform anything that BODs can do in the short term but I've had experience of trying to pitch prediction engines against government incumbencies um, in particularly in the rail sector and the reality is that it won't matter whether it's right or wrong it'll matter whether it's official it'll matter whether it's bods compliant in the medium term if if that is free and universal um so it'll have a it will have a chilling effect on um provision elsewhere not necessarily because it's it's better but because it's free and, it, and it's a standard so we 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 need to just um think you know whether that's appropriate because you know most likely what will happen is that if if bods goes down that route at a certain point in time there'll be some resource limit on the on, on the outside envelope you know there'll be an envelope around usage and then there'll be rate limiting and then there'll be people who can access the free predictions will be limited in some way uh, but by that time a lot of structural changes may have taken place in the supplier market so i think it needs it needs some careful thought. Yeah, I know yeah. it's, but I know this is Wales, Julie. I, I, I see the, the, but Wales. What was said in that seminar is that Wales will have to adapt to bods um, because um, already there's a big overlap. There's a lot of data in bods, Welsh data in bods, and they don't want the Welsh government doesn't want to duplicate spending. So you know it's it will be influenced and may have to copy bods. Yeah. Okay, Mike. No, I was going to say, sure, if if what Jonathan says is correct, then potentially that that's a big threat to the likes of Vix and Trapeze, isn't it? I should imagine. If Bods is effectively could be the the all singing or dancing repository for information and aggregating information for. Yeah, I mean, what what Mira says about that because I've talked to her about it is that um, suppliers will have to add more value; they'll have to go up 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 the you know, value chain. That's their thinking. Um, so that, that's the current uh, reasoning about it. But I think there are other secondary consequences that haven't necessarily been thought through. The, the other thing I was going to say about the this standard that you're proposing, Tim, does that mean if we're looking at buying or you know using new displays in where we are then we should be waiting for this because rather than using a the cms that 
that comes with whatever we buy because you can't wait forever can you um and is, is it is it not the case that Siri SM would be the standard for driving and display at the moment or have I got that wrong I probably have got that fundamentally wrong haven't I could you drive no, a display I mean, with you can drive um display systems with with Siri SM um and um you could imagine that um some th this standard might um have very similar functionality and approach um to to Siri SM but Siri SM doesn't do things like messaging particularly well um you can do it but it's a bit clunky um and quite limited um it certainly doesn't do fault management and and that sort of thing and it doesn't do um graphic for for when you get to that sort of point um so uh, so there is nothing off the shelf per se um in a in a european standards context that um you can just lift and use which is why um this works needed um in terms of um waiting you know, by the end of the year we'll have something very basic suppliers will then need to implement it so it really depends on um time scales for um when you need to achieve things now uh, if you if you were looking to buy new displays in a year's time um and had got a content management system supplier that had implemented this then that might be okay but if you're needing to do things this financial year it's probably a bit short for uh, for implementation and proving it but you the the proposal you've got here is for three different types of interface the standard interface the battery interface and the graphical interface is that right yeah they'll all they'll all build on um the text based interface yeah. so they so we'll start with the text and then we'll build in the uh the requirements it doesn't necessarily mean that particularly for something like um graphical displays and uh the off-grid ones you won't need a content management system that is the actual one that dis that um manages the displays because of power management and, and communication um issues but you'll get to the point where you only need to be putting in messages in one place rather than multiple places which is the current situation if you've got a range of different um display suppliers in your um in your suite of bus stops right right yeah okay yeah it, it, it's an interesting idea i know in like we're looking at battery signs in Leicester and I know that that has to use its own proprietary interface for saving power etc so mm. yeah yeah but in future you might have minimal to do with that um you no know, whereas at the moment you'd have to put messages into that and that sort of thing yeah yeah okay it was interesting it, supplies involved in in this st standard setting or is yes. it just yes yeah yeah all of all of the likely lads and lassies are involved um and uh, one or two that uh, we've not seen uh, in the uk before are uh, expressing an interest okay thank you okay um other standards things if there's nothing more on that um the um European standards, um, Siri, the um, update to that is just going through the formal voting and editing processes at the moment. And so I expect Siri 2.1 um, still to be released by the end of the year, um, which is um, good news. Um, there is... Um, work waiting approval to start for control actions which i went through last time so this is what a uh, control room um, might do um, or a traffic management center might do in terms of managing vehicles that aren't 
necessarily affecting public transport information. Um, so that's just waiting for approval to start. Um, the work on um, NetEx to create um, an accessibility profile um, is progressing pretty rapidly um, at the moment. Um, the use cases, um, I think, are in place um, and starting to look at what data already exists um, that people have got and what data people um, think that they need, both public transport specialists, but also um, users. Um, so um, some of the accessibility user groups and things like that. Um, all European at the moment. Um, there is a what I've got a watching brief on it at the moment, um, but um, nobody else in the UK and um, no UK specific suppliers are expressing enough interest for me to do anything other than um, keep a watching brief on that. Um, if anybody wants to get involved in that and understand accessibility needs for data and how it should be modelled. Um, then please do get in touch um, because um, it would be really good to have another set of uh, eyes and ears involved in that group. Um, and that's probably it in terms of active European standard stuff that is to do with data standards. Um, has anybody got any questions? Keith. Sorry, it's Keith. Not about what you've just said. I don't know if you were talking about that, but in the last meeting, I think it came up again that Julie mentioned about accessibility data between Dr. J, and they said they were working on business cases for that. I was just curious whether they've done that or not, are they waiting for the European stuff to do it on NetEx and then use that for their business case, or is it just something in a standstill at the moment still? Yeah, Dr. J. Uh, sorry, I went to my camera on. It's playing up and chewing up my computer at the moment. Um, we've taken a business case for a data discovery of um, how we can build accessibility data into NAPTAN, what we need to do in terms of building in the data structure and all of those pieces, what would need to happen to local authorities and the software that they're using. So we're trying to get an entire look at that. Um, we've taken that through to the SRO board and they've approved it. We're just getting that through purchasing and we hope to get that discovery done, if I say by the end of the year, that would be a, a, a wishful um, and a kind of the best um, timeline. Possibly very early in the new year, we would be able to start reporting that data discovery. Trust me that you will all be dealing with me more than you ever wanted to do over the next couple, couple of months. There'll be me and some some data engineers and some uh, a, a data specific BA coming to talk to you about accessibility, how you might use it, how it might leak in, what you would need to do to get it in and all of that stuff. So um, be prepared is all I can say. So and this I'm will all be an my usual grin. Sorry, this will all be an extension into the current NAPTAN project for X amount of years then I assume. Is that um I don't know anything about that. That would be the outcome of the, of the discovery because one of the things that we have to consider is the impact on local authorities. And that's one of the pieces that we have will be asked to report back is what burden will that put on local authorities and how what mitigations DFT might need to provide. Um, so we want to really make sure that we've got all of that information together and can prevent present it in a really, really coherent way. So yes, do expect to hear from me a lot over the, over the coming months. And given that NAPTAN has been the neglected 
but golden child or valuable child for such a long time, giving it a, a little bit of investment for some time to get it set up solid and um, future proofed would be wonderful if we could do that. Because um, when was 2.1 created? That was 2002. Um, it's now of drinking age and could go to the pub and get a beer. Um, it may we may want to actually do something with it. That's all that I can say. Thank you. That's that's an excellent. <laughs> yeah, yes. The standard is old enough to go drinking. Yes, <laughs> says a lot. Right. Okay. Um, we haven't had anything raised for the issue log. Um, I will remind you that um, if you think there are um, problems with any of the standards that you've come across, um, or you will think there should be a change to any of the standards, then this is the forum to raise them. We can then put them in the issues log and track them through. Um, the issues log has been remarkably quiet over the last few years. Um, but I don't believe that any of the standards are perfect. So um, I am slightly nervous um, because I think there ought to be things being raised that uh, that aren't. Um, not that I know what they are, but I'm just aware that, you know, these things are never perfect. Um, so I would encourage you to um, use the issues log and the process to, uh, to help make change. Um, in terms of next time we meet, traditionally we would have a meeting just before Christmas. Um, so um, we will um, get heads together um, and, and suggest something um, in early December um, for another get together. Um, that will be quite an interesting time to see the progress with BODs. Um, as we head towards the year end and compliance, um, legal compliance deadlines and things like that. Um, is, uh, I still propose that we continue to meet remotely, um, just the reduction in travel time and um, emissions probably worth it, um, aside from any um, virus related issues. Um, is there any other business from anybody? Does that, does that mean there's never going to be another face-to-face -face meeting then? <laughs> well, I think given the number of people and the amount of travel that's involved in getting everybody together, I think that it's something that we should really seriously consider um, whether we do need to meet face-to-face. Um, but it would certainly want to be a hybrid meeting. Um, so if people didn't want to travel or couldn't, then they could still participate. He's having sandwiches delivered out. Because <laughs> <laughs> they were particularly good. I think that was right, wasn't it, P-Tick? Or was it Travel Line? No, it was Travel Line, wasn't it? The, yeah, yeah, yeah it was travel line. It wasn't Peter. Or you got his coffee. Travel line morning. sandwiches it, were the best. There, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh well, there you go, Julie. Did Deliver that have a secret, a decent data system? Just stop, give everybody stop, stop hey, really nice sandwiches, and you, you've done. Yeah, <laughs> I'll shut up now. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Of any other business, it's a bit left field, but I've been asked to help raise awareness of the Reese Jeffries Road Fund competition. Um, I know it's not directly related to this kind of topic, but it might, given they're looking for creative ideas and there's money to hand it, there's going to be a lot of stuff coming out on the web. But they're looking into kind of changing travel trends, um, encouraging changing behaviors in road users, people friendly ways. It's not just motorways, it's local highways and streets as well. So I don't know, I just thought I'd throw it out there. It might be worth, even if it's friends of friends or whatever. Yeah, no, you're quite, you're quite right. Um, I'm trying to find the link to it. To um, we'll we'll send out 
I'll, I'll add the link. It's, it, the website is just rjrf.uk. Can't get much shorter than that, really. <laughs> right. But I will send it out in the in. Well, if, if, if we're happy to, I'll, I'll stick it in the. What was it send, called? Send that separate what? email, Theresa. Yeah, I didn't tell you what it. Theresa. I didn't tell you what you said. What was it called? Was, yeah, it's the Reese Jeffries Road Fund, um, and the website is rjrf.uk. Put it in the meeting minutes. We'll all get it really soon then. <laughs> I think an email might be uh, might be a good idea as well as that. Although I have promised I'm paying to do it by the end of September. Hang on, I'll just stick it in here. Oh. Okay. I'm still getting my head around it to be honest. Um, but uh, that was this morning and we're here now, so I thought I'd just share it out. Uh, but there's money sounds children can take it. They're trying to open it up to loads of people. So you might have, you know, you might have kids or whatever that are interested in coming up with ideas, but they want creative ideas. They don't necessarily want a fully fledged solution. They want kind of like visioning and stuff. Who doesn't, I suppose, but No, that would be good. We've got some very creative, thoughtful people on the call. So, yeah. Okay. Any other business? No. In which case, thank you all for your time this afternoon. Hope you uh, found it useful. Um, and um, see you in December, if not um, before.